Most people tend to hate dental photography because it's so hard to get your head around it all. What camera or lens do I buy? Will this work with that? What settings do I need to use? And how do I even position the patient? Usually all these things combined will put you off from taking photos. In this three part series, I'm going to simplify things as best as I can to make dental photography achievable for everyone. Let's get into it. So in this first episode of the series, I'm going to cover all the necessary equipment starting from camera, lens and flash all the way down to even the SD cards and which cloths to use. So use the timestamps below to skip around if you want to. In the next video, I'll talk you through figuring out the settings that you need for your setup and in the last video, I'll show you my technique for actually taking the photos. Okay, so let's start with equipment. Now some of you might be in a practice that has a shared camera, but here's why I think you should get your own. First of all, if you have your own camera in your surgery right next to you at all times, you're way more likely to actually be taking photos rather than having to plan ahead and asking your nurse to get the practice camera. And once you've actually spent some money to get your own, you would want to get your money's worth. So again, way more likely to take photos. Also, others in the practice might change the settings on the camera and it gets really annoying having to play around with the settings each time. And you should be seeing this as a long-term investment, just like loops. You'll be using this for many years ahead and will make patient communication so much easier and you can learn so much more from analyzing your own work. So the camera setup consists of three parts, the body, the lens, and the flash. In the description, you'll find a link to the blog post where I've written the suggestions for all the equipment suggested in this video with information on price and specification. I've also included links to where to buy them, both new and used. If you can afford getting everything new, then go for it. But picking up used camera parts from a reputable website like mpb.com is also a great option, and I would personally recommend it. I've purchased used items quite a few times now, and I've had no problems so far. You'll also notice in the blog post, I mentioned the weight of all the different parts. And that's because one of my main suggestions is to try and build a setup that's nice and lightweight, because it makes taking photos so much easier. You'll also notice that I give quite a few options, and I'll mention which ones you go for depends on your budget. The general advice is, if you can afford it, get all the main components in the same brand. So for example, get a Canon body with a Canon lens and a Canon flash. This kind of setup is more expensive compared to mixing brands, but they tend to be a little bit more reliable and compatible. So for the camera body, you can go with either a Canon or Nikon DSLR. It really doesn't matter. You'll get great results with each. If you're trying to decide, see which brands your friends and colleagues around you have and go with the same one. That way, if you need help with the camera, then you can ask them for advice. If I had to choose between Canon and Nikon, I would personally choose Canon because you have a lot more choice when it comes to the lenses and the flashes. Most people also have Canon, which again makes it easier to get advice if you need it. But I'll also be including Nikon suggestions in case you already have a Nikon camera. You can also go for a Sony mirrorless camera like I have, and there are quite a few good reasons as to why you might want to. And later in the video, I'll cover those reasons. But bear in mind, there's not much information on the internet for using a Sony mirrorless camera for dental photography. So if you're a beginner, I wouldn't really suggest it because you might struggle to find help and advice online. So when choosing a camera body, you can get one with either a full frame sensor or a crop sensor. The crop sensors, as the name suggests, just crops the picture in more. For dental photography, I suggest you get a crop sensor because they're much cheaper, smaller and more lightweight and you don't have to be so close to the patient to get a very close up shot. Which body you go with purely depends on your budget in my opinion. If photography is not a hobby for you and this camera will only be used for dental photography, get one of the cheaper and lighter ones because all the features and specifications of the more expensive camera won't be of any use to you. One feature, however, that might actually be useful for you in the more expensive cameras is the ability to control wireless flashes. So if you think you want to go for a more advanced setup with wireless flashes on a bracket, then you might want to opt for a camera with that feature. And again, all of this is noted in the blog post for which camera has these features. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned going with a Sony mirrorless, and I really think that might be the future of dental photography and no one is really talking about it. Traditional DSLR cameras have a mirror inside which bounces light into the viewfinder that you look through. Mirrorless cameras have gotten rid of this mirror, which makes the camera much smaller and lighter. Look at the difference in size. The smaller and more lightweight form factor makes it easier to take shots even with one hand if you need to. But this isn't the main reason I suggest mirrorless cameras. In fact, some people might not like that it's so small but the main reason I recommend them is because of something called focus peaking. One of the main complaints and problems people have with dental photography is that it's too hard to make sure that you're in focus on the teeth and so the photos come out blurry. Focus peaking on mirrorless cameras highlight the edges of the areas which you're trying to focus on. So when I take a photo, I don't need to take off my loops and my visor or even look through the viewfinder to make sure I'm in focus. I can just point the camera, move it back and forth until the blue lines show around the tooth and then I can take my shot. This is honestly the biggest game changer, especially during AGPs. 
having to take off loops and trying to look through the viewfinder with a massive stealth mask is very difficult. This solves all of that. Now, before I move on to talk about lenses, I'd really appreciate it if you guys give the video a thumbs up. It really helps our channel grow and reach more people. Thank you. So next is the lens. For dental photography, you need to opt for a macro lens with a one-to-one -one magnification ratio. A macro lens, as the name suggests, is for shooting small things, and the one-to-one -one magnification ratio means that the real-life size of the subject is projected onto the camera sensor. And the main thing to consider when choosing a lens is the focal length. This focal length is basically how zoomed in the lens is. The higher the number, the more zoomed in. The options usually start from 60 millimeters and go up to 105 millimeters. So if I stand in the same spot and take a photo with a 100 millimeter lens and a 60 millimeter lens, you'll see that the 100 millimeter lens is much more zoomed in. Lenses with a focal length of 90 to 105 millimeters are generally best for dental photography. The only time I would recommend a 60 or 85 millimeter lens is if you're really short. It means you don't have to be so far out from the patient to get a close up shot. If you're really short and you go for a 105mm lens, you might have to tiptoe when trying to take photos when the patient is lying flat in the chair. When it comes to picking up the lens, again, I think it's down to your budget and the weight of the lens. The more expensive lenses out there have features like image stabilization or better autofocus motors, but both of these features aren't used much in dental photography and they end up making the lens heavier. I've made a list of all the options in the blog post with their respective prices and weights so you can compare. In the list, there are other brand lenses included such as Tamron, Sigma and Samyang. These companies make amazing lenses for Canon, Nikon and Sony cameras and they're a great option. When buying these lenses, make sure you buy the one for your specific brand. As I mentioned before, if you can afford to get the same brand as your camera, then go for it. The less brand mixing you do, the more compatible and reliable all the parts will be. Next up is the flash. The flash is the one that will affect how your photos look the most. And this is where you need to choose if you want to go down the more easier, more basic route or the more expensive and advanced route. There are three different options you can either go with. A ring flash, a twin flash or a twin flash on a bracket. There are more advanced options like massive soft boxes, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. The ring flash is what I would recommend for most people because it's the easiest to use and you can consistently get good anterior and posterior shots. The light with a ring flash is very close to the lens which means light can travel straight all the way down to the back of the mouth and so you'll get good, well-lit posterior shots. The disadvantage of the ring flash is that the reflection of the light on the anterior teeth is not as aesthetically pleasing as with twin flashes. The reflection tends to be around the center of the tooth and makes the image look more flat. Twin flashes, on the other hand, produce a much nicer reflection, which highlights the vertical primary anatomy lines and produces a much nicer texture. You can take it a step further by mounting the twin flashes on a bracket. This looks even nicer as you can move the flashes further apart and if you use something to make the light softer like a diffuser, you can get shots that look very soft and hide imperfections. Having your flashes on a bracket also allows you to get very well lit posterior shots because you can move the light very close to the lens and closer to your subject so the light reaches all the way to the back of the mouth. As you can see, this is where the twin flash setup gets a little bit more advanced and complicated. So my flash recommendation would be this. If you're more of a beginner and aren't concerned about getting the absolutely best looking anterior shots or the softest photo, get a ring flash. I have my recommendations based on budget in the blog post. If you're more concerned about anterior shots, like a lot of whitening, Invisalign or bonding cases, get a twin flash. And if you want to take it a step further, mount the twin flashes on a bracket. If you're going for the bracket option straight away, remember it's best to get a camera with a wireless flash support and a pair of wireless speed lights to mount on the bracket. This setup will be lighter than getting a twin flash with wires and mounting that on a bracket. In the blog post, I'll put a link for the bracket I recommend, which is the owl bracket. Now, if you opt for twin flashes on a bracket or not, you can make your photos look much nicer by making the light softer. This is called diffusion, and it's when the light passes through some sort of material which helps the light spread, and it makes it look softer rather than very harsh and bright. The diffuser you use will depend on the flash that you have. A good starting place is to Google the name of your flash followed by diffuser. You might be able to find specific ones for your flash. If not, there are these generic soft boxes that you can buy from Amazon that tend to fit on most flashes. A safe and cheap option, which is what I have done for my flashes at the moment, is to make your own diffusion paper. You need to buy thick 90 GSM tracing paper and some Velcro. Again, links in the blog post for all of this. Take one sheet of tracing paper and fold it over twice. Tape the three edges shut with some clear tape. Now, depending on the shape of your flash, 
you need to put Velcro on each side so you can attach the paper to your flash like this. You can take it on and off each day and over time if your paper gets ripped or folded you can just make another one because you have a whole pad of tracing paper. This is so easy to do and can take your photos to the next level. If you want to get more professional looking diffusers then I would recommend Dr. Minesh Patel's photography kit. I'll put a link for that in the description. So moving on, for your flashes you'll most likely need to buy some batteries. Flashes require a lot of power so it's best to use a rechargeable nickel metal hydride battery rather than the typical alkaline batteries. The most commonly suggested is the Panasonic Onloop Pro batteries but the IKEA Lada batteries are a third of the price. There's a theory out there that these IKEA batteries are the exact same as the Onloop Pro batteries but just branded differently and it's because there's only one factory currently in Japan that can make these nickel metal hydride batteries. So save yourself some money and get the IKEA batteries with the IKEA battery charger as well. People have tested it and they're basically the same battery. The last thing that's left for the camera is the SD card. I suggest you get a fast one so it can handle saving multiple JPEG and RAW files quickly. Again, links for my recommendation are in the blog post. Now, to store all of this, I recommend you get a camera bag. I use a newer bag which has lots of inserts with Velcro so you can optimize the shape of the compartments to fit your equipment. It's quite big so I can even fit my loops in there. But only buy a camera bag once you have all your equipment ready so you can be sure that everything will fit in there. So, moving on from the camera, there's a few more things you'll need to be able to take good photos. Those are cheek and lip retractors, contrasters, mirrors and microfiber cloths. Again, I've got links for all these in the blog post but I'll just quickly go through why I've chosen each one. Cheek retractors come in metal or plastic. I personally prefer plastic ones because I think they're a bit more comfortable for the patient. Lip retractors are essential when taking occlusal shots. Without them, the patient's lip tends to curl over the incisal edges and then to move them you have to use your fingers and now you've got fingers in your photos and it just looks horrible. So make sure you use lip retractors. Contrasters are great for anterior cases as you can get photos with black backgrounds. They come in either metal finishes or silicon. I would suggest you get the silicon coated ones because they're more durable, don't scratch as quickly and they're more comfortable for the patient. Sometimes with the metal ones, when you tilt them, you might hit the patient's teeth and hurt them or even fracture a bit of the tooth. You can also get ones which are flexible and these are great because it makes them so much easier to hold. The next important item is the mirrors. Mirrors can come in different coatings like chromium, rhodium, titanium or ultra bright dielectric. The difference between them is their scratch resistance and reflectivity. Chromium coating reflects about 65% of the light, rhodium 75%, titanium 80% and the dielectric ultra bright reflects 99%. So of course the best is the dielectric but they're super expensive. My recommendation would be titanium because of their high reflectance and scratch resistance. When buying mirrors watch out because some sites only sell one-sided mirrors. If you can, Opt for two-sided ones because if you scratch one side, you can still use the other side for photos. Mirrors come in a variety of sizes and shapes, but the three most important ones are the occlusal, buckle and lingual ones. For the occlusal one, I would recommend getting a long adult one. The long ones are better than the standard because when you hold the mirrors in the corners, it's less likely that your fingers will be in the shot because they're extra long. The buckle ones you can use for your buckle and lingual shots and also your quadrant photos for posteriors. Lingual mirrors have a curve which makes it easier to get the mirror in to get your lingual shots because you can bypass the anterior teeth. As always, I have links in the description for my recommendation. Now, if you want your mirrors to last, you really need to take good care of them. Teach everyone in your team that handles the mirrors on the best way to clean them. First of all, never wipe them with a paper towel because they're abrasive and will scratch the surface. If you warm up your mirrors with warm water, dry them with either the 3-in-1 spray or use a microfiber cloth. Don't stack mirrors on top of each other and don't put other instruments on top of them. The best way to clean them is either cold sterilization or autoclave. And if you have the budget, you can get specific cassettes to hold your mirrors. And lastly, there's a couple of accessories for your camera you might want to buy. I recommend having some sort of reliable camera strap just in case you drop your camera. I know it sounds silly but the last thing you want to do is drop a camera on the floor or even your patient. You might also want to get a blower to clean any dust off the camera sensor. When you're taking the lens on and off the camera, make sure to hold the camera upside down. This helps prevent dust from getting onto your sensor. When dust gets on your sensor, you see these little black spots in your photos consistently. If that does happen, you need to use one of these blowers to clean the sensor. Whatever you do, don't try to blow off the dust with your mouth. 
So that was everything in terms of equipment. I know it was a lot, but I hope you found it useful. A lot of effort has gone into this series. So if you enjoyed this episode, please give the video a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next one. Stay tuned for the next episode where I'm gonna teach you how to figure out all the different settings for your camera and your flash.